If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 22, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Numbers 22, in the first verse, the Bible says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they, they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field, and Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor uh, to Pethroth, which is on the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I, I shall prevail, that we may, spite, uh, we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursedest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed, with the rewards of divination in their hands. And they came unto Balaam, and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again as, uh, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode it with Balaam. And God is said unto Balaam, and God came unto Balaam, and said, What men... Are thee, are these with thee? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your kindness and your watch care. Lord, we praise you for our church. Lord, we thank you uh, that there's a people that will gather together and that is interested in your cruise and your name. Lord, we pray. We pray this morning that you would open our eyes to study. Lord, that we would see you in the scriptures in every way. God, help us as a people together that you might meet with us and that you might thrill our hearts this morning for being here. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we preach it this morning when God comes, when Jesus comes, and when the Holy Ghost comes. Now, uh, in the day that we live, and it is the church age in my opinion, the only one that comes nowadays is the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus can't come. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And God can't come because He's sinless. And He manifests Himself through the Holy Ghost. But we're going to look through the history of God's people. And at one time, they all came. They, they presented themselves. They did great things. And then they withdrew. Uh, in the first verse, and the children of Israel set forward. Now, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing today if God's people set forward? That means move forward. That means gaining a little extra ground. But what I've seen among God's people today, they're happy right where they're at. And they'll use any excuse available. And this is the one I always hear. Well, it's the day which we live. Well, you ain't lived in any worse day than there's ever been. You, did you know this? In, in the days, I think of it was Rehoboam, it says the house of the Sodomites was next door to the temple. You know, we that would be just like them opening a gay bar next year to our building. We, we haven't got that bad yet, so we ought to praise the Lord for what we do have. And, and, and start pitching forward a little bit. You know what people perceive as pitching forward is more people in the building. 
That's not pitching forward. Pitching forward is gaining ground spiritually. And you know what? I don't see that a lot among God's people anymore. They come defeated and they leave defeated. Uh, and, and you know, again, they always have the very same excuse. It's the day which we live. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. Now, I want you to see... They were so close to Jordan. Now, let me say this. Because of fear and unbelief, for 40 years, this is as close as they would get. Uh, they were defeated after this day. But I want you to see they were pitched forward. They, they were moving toward... And you know what? They weren't scared of the Moabites. They, they were on... Uh, Israel was on the Moabites' land and it didn't worry them because you knew what? <laughs> you know who would be living there one day, two and a half tribes of the nation of Israel? That was right before the Jordan River. And one day, those two and a half tribes would dwell there and they would give God great glory. So they weren't upset. You know what? When we gain a little ground, don't be upset. You know, if you have people come to the house of God from another church, so what? And, and, and we get so easily offended in the modern day. But you know what? We should rejoice when we gain ground. Verse 2, And Balak, which was the ruler of the Moabites, and Balak the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Now, the Amorites were a defeated people. God helped them defeat them. But do you remember the one mistake that they made? The Amorites came out and said, let's make a deal. Y'all remember that old game show? And their deal was this, we'll be your servants if you let us leave. But what was God's plan? Kill everybody in sight. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That sounds cruel. And, and that kind of rubs the flesh the wrong way. But that was God's plan. I can't say that I can... Well, yeah, I can say that I understand it. He wanted the idolatry gone. Before they took the land and before they possessed it. And you know what? They didn't do it. And they had trouble with idolatry for the entire history of Israel. And, and, and so we see then that uh, God had a plan and God was with them as long as they followed Him. In fact, that was His promise to Moses. Moses, if you'll follow me, I'll be with you. But they didn't always do that. Verse uh, uh, 4. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of uh, Zippor was king of, Moabites at that time, of the Moabites at that time. Now I want you to see that, have you ever noticed when God's people make advances, that their enemies come together. They can be the worst kind of enemies that when God's people have, have, have a victory, they're going to come together. You, you know, what, what amazes me, and you, you, can, you can follow this even in the history that we, that we have today, that uh, uh, the Democrats... There's a group of them that, that, that fights for, you know, if you're here, you deserve citizenship. They could have crossed the border in the car trunk, but they're still a citizen if they make it, according to the Democrats. And in the very same breath, they'll defend killing our own children. You know why? Because they've come together. The enemies of God, they can be totally different, and then they'll, then they'll come together. Uh, to defeat God's people. And that's exactly what, what was happening here. Or at least that's what, <laughs> that's what he wanted it to happen. Verse 5. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, uh, to Pethroth, uh, to Pethroth, uh, uh, which is by the river uh, of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there's a people come out from Egypt. Be behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Now, I want you to see that this Balaam is a type of a Christian. 
Because he knew God. Now the reason I say he knew God is because God answered his prayer and he wasn't a Jew, so he was a Gentile believer, just like you and I. Uh, he, he, he was not an individual that was in the Jewish lineage. And, and, and so he, and apparently he had a reputation of dealing with God. Do you have that reputation? It, it was such that, uh, that, that the other leader respected him May not believe like he did, but he respected him. And he saw this, he knew that God was with him. And, and so he approached him with the plan, let's, let's uh, link up together and defeat this people. Now let me ask you this, how many times has the world came your way and said, let's link up together? You know what, every time that you hear that, you know what it should be, a resounding no. I'm not linking up with you. I have no intention of doing that. And, and it will come in a very subtle way. Now they're too, much, much too smart to say let's link up. But uh, they'll say, I know there's some things we can agree on. Well, I can agree on that that's a black coat, but it doesn't mean that I want to hook up with you. You see what I'm saying? But that's where they'll begin something, something very, very small, and, and, and pretty soon you're hooked in. And that's exactly so. Despite Balaam being one of God's people, he was easily led astray. And you will be too, if you're not very, very careful. Verse 6 Come now, therefore, I pray thee. Verse 6 uh, Come now, therefore, I pray thee. Curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Now you listen to this. If you don't get anything else out of the message this morning, you get this one. You better never curse Israel. Right. That, that's exactly what he was saying. He says, you come on, uh, Balaam, you come with me and we'll curse this people. You know what? That'd be the biggest mistake that Balaam ever made. And listen, he tried to make it. <laughs> But you know what? God wouldn't let him. Right. You talk about a sovereign God, he ended up breaking Balaam's leg over it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we see then that we need to be very careful when it comes to Israel and the leaders we put over this nation. You, you know what? Hillary Clinton hates Israel. Be very, very careful of the people that we put in our leadership. Verse 7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination. Now what is divination? Divination is tricking somebody. And, and what they were doing was trying to trick Balaam in coming out against Israel. Divination is making the facts mur uh, muddy. Making the facts seem like uh, something they're not. Divination is presenting true, the true facts in a fashion that they're a lie. And that's exactly what he did. And you know what? They went right uh, away rejoicing. You know what they thought? They thought they had Balaam in their back pocket. They left there thinking they had a great victory. But you know what? God shows up. Isn't it a wonderful thing when God shows up? When He intervenes and makes a, an everlasting difference among God's people. That, that, that's a great and marvelous thing. And I don't think God's people today recognize it for what it is. And uh, the reason why they don't see God as sovereign. They see God as somebody waiting for them to do something, to accept Him. You know what? Whether you accept it or not this morning, God's on the throne and doing all things well. And it really don't matter what you think about it. You know what? Mankind don't want to be put down here. But listen, that's exactly where we are. And if He smiled grace on you and saved your soul, all you can say is, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because you know what? It's nothing you deserved. <laughs> And I'll go even further. It's nothing you even ask for. It's because of the goodness of God. And so we find then, uh, they went away pretty happy with what they had done. 
They thought they got old Balaam in their back pocket. Verse 8. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night. Now, uh, what's the problem? Now again, I believe, I believe Balaam was a believer because God spoke to him. Do you want a bunch of idolaters spending the night with you? You know, uh, what would be... Uh, what does the Bible teach? Come out from among them and be you separate. And listen, that's just not so we can look like a bunch of apes out here different than everybody else. It's because it's a protected people that have a relationship with God. And when we compromise ourselves, we compromise that relationship. And, and so what we need, uh, what he should was say, y'all go camp over there and I'm going to seek the face of God and see what God really thinks about this. And, and, but no, no, he said, God's here all night. You bet up with me. You know, you know what will happen if you bet up with sinners? You'll start acting just like them. And, and, and that was the problem. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these? <coughs> now, two wonderful things happens in verse 9. And if you skip on and keep on reading, you won't get it. And the Lord... <laughs> And God is what your text says. And God came unto Balaam. What, what a wonderful, glorious thing when the very God of the Bible, the great God Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, the very God of all the universe, comes down and speaks to a man like Balaam, a Gentile, someone that don't even know and understand what Jewish tradition is, comes down and speaks with him, and ask him a question. Now, you know what? When God asks, asks a question, it's not because he don't know it. Right. The Bible says he knoweth all things. Which, if you take that in, that's pretty sober in and of itself, isn't it? He knoweth all things. So why would he possibly ask Balaam a question if he already knew the answer? Well, I can tell you, he wanted Balaam to know it. Right? Uh, remember when Elijah's on the backside of the mountain and they're afraid in that cave all bundled up? And he says, Eli What doest thou here, Elijah? He knew why Elijah was up in that cave, scared to death from Jezebel. But he wanted Elijah to know it. You know, it came down to this with, Eli with Elijah in that cave. He believed Jezebel more than he believed God. Because what was, what was the threat from Jezebel? So be with me by the gods tomorrow if I don't make you as one of them. And he believed her and left and ran like a scared rabbit. See, we should never as God's people be in that condition. Uh, we really don't have anything to be scared of because God, God is always with us. So God came and God met with him and he asked him a question. Verse 10, And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, and he goes on, but he answers the question without ever even getting why God asked it. He said who he was and just kept right on going. You know, you know what the real question is? Balak is an idolater. Balak hates God. Balak is not a believer. Balaam, you better listen to me. What is Balak about? Now, when you think of that this morning, what are your friends about? What, what, what do they present like? Not their names. I don't want to know their names, but who are they? Where do they come from? What makes them tick? That's what we need to know. And the only people you really need around you will be the ones that promote the thing of Christ in you. 
That, that, that's the friends you need. That, that's the ones you need. And, and so we find here that really Balaam misses the boat on his question from God. Drop down to verse 22. Uh, verse 20, excuse me. Verse 20, the Bible says again, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. So he got his command from God. And again, what a glorious, wonderful thing. And, and, and we, don't, we don't treasure that because we read it so much. God came down in his person again to Balak, uh, to Balaam, excuse me, and says, yeah, you go with them, but you say what I want you to say. Now, uh, that's just like a missionary going into a heathen nation that, that are idolaters and that hate God in every way. And, he, and His command is go, but you tell them what I say to tell them. You tell them about the gospel. You tell them about the goodness of Christ. You tell them about what salvation really is. You go, but tell them what I say. But Balaam didn't do that. Balaam compromised. Balaam, remember uh, that little she-ass preached a good sermon, didn't she? And it finally, it finally woke him up a little bit. You know what we need from time to time is just a good sermon. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what we need. And, and so what, uh, uh, as God comes down... There's always a result. You know what? I look forward to the day. I, 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 I tremble at the thought, but at the very same time, I, I'm excited about the day that I'll see the great God Jehovah. I'll put this flesh aside, and the spirit man that is saved, I can, in that spirit man, I can look on the mighty face of God and live. This flesh can't do that, but this spirit man can. I look forward to the day. Yes. Uh, when God speaks to me. Now, go with me, if you will, to the, the Gospel of Luke. Luke 19, and verse 5. Uh, very familiar verse of Scripture. Luke 19, and verse 5. We'll just get the whole thought, begin in verse 1, Luke 19, in the first verse. The Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now, a publican was a tax collector. Uh, Zacchaeus was a Jewish man working for the Roman occupation. And, and that's where he got his money, and he collected Roman tax. He didn't collect uh, taxes for the Jewish people because there was no such nation at that time. He was work, And you know what? These people that crossed the border and was Jewish but worked for the Roman government, they weren't real popular people. Because what they did, they didn't make much money. So it'd be like this. I went down to Matthew's house and I said, Matthew, your house is worth about $70,000. Your taxes this year is going to be $550. But you know what the Roman government said was 450. But how I padded my my pocket was that extra hundred dollars. And that's how they made their money. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew how corrupt they were. Everybody knew how ungodly they were, how they turned against their own people. They they knew what they were up to. Exactly. And you know what? They were hated for it. How many people's ever seen the abortion clinic down in Nashville? Anybody but me? I'll give you two things about it. First of all, 
It's on the very edge of the worst part of town. And the reason why is because they have a people group they want to take care of. And I'll give you, that'll be just food for thought the rest of the week. Now, the second reason <laughs> is this. They, they want money. And they know where to get it. See, this is the thing with abortion clinics. They'd go out of business if there wasn't any abortions, wouldn't they? The nursing home I work for, you know why it does so well? There, you can't throw a rock in Montgomery County without hitting a veteran in the head with it. Because that's what, that's what, that's what our business thrives on. And, and in the very same way, they're looking for babies to kill. And you know what? They ought to be a, uh, we can't despise those people. And as hard as it is and as outside our, our thinking it is, you know, the nurses, and listen, there's registered nurses just like me and Donna that work in that mess every day. You know what we need to do? Pray that somehow God can get a hold of them. Because He's able. And so, it was wrong for them to hate Zacchaeus. They, they should have been praying for Zacchaeus. Just like we should be praying for people like that that's caught up in sin so bad that they can't see the light of day. We ought to be praying for them. Verse 4. Uh, verse 3, excuse me. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for, I'm, for today I must abide at thy house. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, did Zacchaeus want to be saved? Doesn't say that, does it? Said he wanted to see him and who he was. You know, a lot of people uh, see supposed pictures of Jesus, but they don't know, want, want to know who he was. Uh, they don't have any interest in the person of Christ. They, they, have a, they have an interest in the idea of Christ, but not the Christ of the Bible. And, and so Zacchaeus, all he wanted was a visual. But the Lord Jesus came along and said, Zacchaeus, you know what? That's the effectual call. That's him looking in the uh, face of another individual and saying, you come with me. And you can read the rest of it, but Zacchaeus comes down and, and, and he, uh, he says, I'll give everything back tenfold. Uh, and he has all fruits of redemption. Why? Because the Lord Jesus called him. Uh, Jesus came unto him. Has he come unto you? The Gospel of John chapter 19. John 19. Uh, verse 5. John 19 and verse 5. The Bible says, Then came Jesus forth wearing a crown, a crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. Now I want you to notice two things. That this time when Jesus came, he didn't look like much. Uh, I've seen a lot of trauma, especially earlier in my life. People just road rash, throw through truck windows, just unbelievable stuff. And you know what? It's not pleasant to look at. And Jesus had been beat up. He had his crown of thorns pressed in and the blood was running down and they had the purple or the royal robe on him and they said, Behold! And you know what? Uh, the Jews went and played worship and said, Hail, King of the Jews! You know what? I think a lot of people today, what they're doing is playing worship. They come out of obligation. They go through a routine and then they head back home. 
And we need to be better than that. We, we, we need to look for more and get more out of our worship than what we've been getting. And, and so I want you to see, despite how he looked, despite the trauma, despite being what looked like defeat, he came to it. it it's not the image we want to think about, but he came to them and he presented himself. He looked like he was indeed the sacrifice. Gospel of John chapter 20, uh, uh, verse 19. Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 19. The Bible says, Then the same day at even, when the first day, uh, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, I want you to see the differences this morning when Jesus came this time. Uh, number one, first and foremost, the walls couldn't hold him back. Uh, most buildings in Jerusalem in that time were stone. And he came right through it. The door was barred, the door was locked, and he passed. See, he came this time as a victor, didn't he? Nothing can stop him. Nothing can interfere when Jesus approaches and He came straight through and said, Peace be unto you. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, I will point this out to Seventh-day people. It was on the first day of the week. Not real popular preaching in 2019, but He came on the first day of the week. He arose on the first day of the week. He was established in the Lord's Day. You know, the Lord's Day is different than the Sabbath. In fact, if you'll, if you'll follow even the revelation of Christ, the revelation of God concerning the end times, the Bible says there, I was in the Spirit. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And you know what? If anybody knew what a Sabbath was, it was the Apostle John. Because you know you know how they got into the... the, the uh, the, the hall where Jesus was being tried the night that he, that he was found guilty because John was a very elevated Jew and he got him in. And, and so we find then that this time the Lord comes as God. He presents, uh, Jesus presents as a victor, as someone that is uh, no longer bound by the grave, drop down, uh, uh, to verse 26. And after eight days, again the disciples were within, and Thomas with them, being, uh, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Very same thing, very same victory. But I want you to see this is the problem. Thomas was a doubter. Thomas didn't believe, really. Remember what he said, Big, big Ike? I'll never believe until I thrust my hand in the, in, in the middle of his side and put my finger in the palms of his hands. I'll never believe. And you know what the next verse said? Thomas, come reach hither. And all it says, he never, I don't think he ever did it. He simply said, my Lord and my God. See, that's seeing Jesus. You, you talk about a special bunch of people. Seeing Christ in the resurrection. Those 40 days and 40 nights following the resurrection was incredible. It, it, it would have been unbelievable to see them, uh, to see him doing those things. And you know what? Despite what some people say, you ain't seen Jesus. You have not seen Jesus in the flesh because you know what? From the day that He ascended back to glory, except the times that He met with Paul, He's been right there at the right hand of God. Correct? Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says make an intercession for all the redeemed. And, and so that leaves one thing and one thing only, one person of the holy God of heaven, 
That's for us. Have you seen the Holy Ghost? Now, when I say seen, I mean have you seen His works? Because we'll find very quickly, you, you, don't, you don't visually see the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's, why it's, that's why it's described as mighty rushing wind. You don't see wind, but I've seen the trees do like this, ain't you? You've seen the leaves rustle up. I've seen the results of wind, but I've never seen wind. But you can see the results of it. And listen, we need to understand the Holy Ghost. And the reason why, that's who He is here, is it not? Right. That's the person of God that is the, the, right. the, 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 the active agent right now. And it can only be that way because the other two are in glory. The other two are in heaven already. And so we find that, that the Holy Ghost, have you seen Him? Have you recognized Him? Do you understand who He is? Acts chapter 2, in the very first verse. Acts chapter 2, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, if you want a real movement of the Holy Ghost, we've got to be on the same page. Do you, do you get that? In other words, you can't believe one thing and I believe something else. If you believe some, the third thing, we've got to be on the same page. You know what I fully believe? The reason that we don't have a movement of the Holy Ghost is we're here, there, and yonder. We need to be on the same page. You know what? I'd rather be on the same page with three people but they, than be all on different page, pages of 150. Uh, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to get that part of this verse. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat on each of them. Now, I want you to really, really get this, that this is a real event. This actually happened. And not only did it empower the church, it empowered people. You know, you know what give Peter, and, and this is history, this is not Bible, so we take it for what it is, but I, I've been reading Fox's books, Book of Martyrs again. And Peter's only request at his death was crucify me hang up, hanging upside down because I'm not good enough to be crucified like my Lord. You, you, you know what gives you that kind of strength? The Holy Ghost. It has to be, does it not? Because who else is here? Right. Nobody. If we have the enduring power of the Holy Ghost, then we can do anything that, 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 that He bids us to do. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because every man heard them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, one to another, behold, are not these that which speak Galileans? Now, I want you to see the, the amazing thing of this event wasn't speaking in tongues necessarily. It's what they heard. Now, uh, South American people speak English. It's very different than our English, but it, it is the English language. Uh, Mexicans don't. They have a Spanish dialect. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if I went to visit Brother Kraft, spoke in English, and they heard in Spanish? See, that's what that, that would be amazing, would it not? You know what you know you know what the vendor of that is? The Holy Ghost. And the best I understand, not one thing has changed. 
People will say, oh, that was an apostolic gift. To me, the gift of tongues is people hearing in their own language, not a bunch of jibbery jib that people come up with in so-called Pentecostal churches. I mean people hearing in their own language and, and I can't speak Spanish. You see what I'm saying? Well, what, what a marvelous, marvelous thing that, that that would be if we could hear that and see that today, it would, it, it would be a thrill to our souls. Acts chapter 10, verse 45. Acts chapter 10, verse 45, the Bible says, And they of the circumcision which believed, or the Jews, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to notice two things. Very early in my ministry, everybody told me that that was a one-time event, that the speaking in tongues. The only problem is, is that's not true. It happened at least four distinct times, and probably more than that. Four that's recorded for our benefit. And, and so I want you to see that they were amazed that the Holy Ghost showed up and filled non-Jews. Have, have you ever, have you ever wondered what it would be to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Now, every one of us will say it's salvation. I see what you're saying, but the next day you got up and doubted what God was doing. To me, that's not filled, is it? You know what? Sometimes when it's I'm fixing Joey's meal and I, I will be pouring something into a glass for him and Donna or somebody or she'll run up to me and if I keep pouring and I've done it, <laughs> it just spills over. That's full. Uh, Matthew always tickles me because if I, if I, if I raise the pessimist, he is. And uh, uh, the, the cup is always heavy. Right? And, and you know, that, that's where we operate, is it not? About half empty. About, and, and you know, the problem with being half empty, you can't go nearly as far. Uh, you won't, you, you, you'll run out before you get there. And so we find that this wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost coming to us, is extended to the Jews as well. And they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, and we're not going to get into what he said, but I want you to see that this feeling was magnifying God. Acts 21, Acts 21, and verse 11. Acts 21, and verse 11, the Bible says, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, or belt, and bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. Now, this prophet, this, uh, th this preacher, uh, I think his name, uh, I know he was from Tyre, but at any rate, he was moved of the Holy Ghost to make this demonstration how Paul would die. So I want you to see two things. First of all, there wasn't an audible thing saying, you go preach how Paul's going to die. No record of it, no audible noises, nothing like that going on. He spoke to his heart. It, isn't it a wonderful thing? If you understand, if you don't understand, make your calling and election sure. Isn't it a wonderful thing when God speaks when the Holy Ghost 
speaks to your heart. And as I get older, I try to make a very clear distinction Amen. on the operating agent because it's not Jehovah. He directs the Holy Ghost, but He's, he's not the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is not the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is not Jesus. Now, I understand that they're all three in one, but they have very different offices. If I come home to be a daddy and I started taking Bella's blood pressure as a registered nurse, I've got outside my line. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm being a nurse, which is no problem that, being a nurse at home. But my role there is being daddy. You see what I'm saying? And the role of the Holy Ghost is to minister unto us until we're called away, hopefully at the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last place, Romans chapter 9. And we're going to close. Romans chapter 9, in the very first verse, Paul writes to the church at Rome, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now, again, I want you to see this speaking Paul made a tribute to is the Holy Ghost speaking to us. It says in conscience, in awareness. Uh, are you aware of the Holy Ghost? If you're not aware of His person, listen, something's wrong. Does He speak to you? Does He make His Word a reality? You know why that book is nothing to most people? Because it's not mingled with the Holy Ghost. It's no more than a harlequin romance to most people. Because it's not mingled with the Holy Ghost. What about you? See, when the Holy Ghost comes to you, we're talking about the persons of God coming to you. When the Holy Ghost comes to you, He'll make His Word real. He'll make your condition before Him real. Whether it's good or bad or somewhere in between, He'll make it real. What about you?